Now from Atlanta News First Plus, this is Sports Tonight. Welcome everyone to a f Sports Tonight. I need to remember to press buttons. It's, it's Friday. It's Friday. I'm Ellie Parker here with Emily Gagnon. What's up, guys? It's Friday. <sighs> Basically the Friday before Christmas, right? Yeah. Yeah, I Friday mean, before Christmas. Yeah, is the 24th or 25th bigger in your family? Because everybody does it kind of differently. The 24th. 24th. Yeah? Uh, traditionally in Polish families, it's uh, it's the 24th. That's, all right, and what do y'all do? Anything bigger. different? Um, at least when I moved, when I uh, used to live up in Chicago with my family, uh, we'd go visit one of my grandmothers, and a whole bunch of the family would show up and... Uh, we would just have dinner in terms of uh, what we would do. Um, so yeah, usually it's the it's it's Christmas Eve that's fair. So in my family on the twenty fourth, growing up, my mom would always let me and my sister open one present each, Aww. and yeah, that was kind of like the thing. We could pick whichever gift we wanted out of the Christmas tree or under the Christmas tree, and um, open that. And, I mean, we always have a different kind of dinner for the 24th. It's nothing just, like, regular. It was always something special. But that was our one thing. But 25th is definitely the big yeah. day. And I'm going home to Canada to visit uh -huh. my dad. Yes, I'm jacked. My sister, she's there ahead of time, and she texted me this morning. I'm not even lying. She goes, just so you know, it's really cold here. <laughs> You're in Canada. Huh, like, I yes, wonder. I do believe that it's going to be very cold when I get there. Only there for a few days, but um, I look forward to stuffing or dressing however however I know there's difference um, I'm not sure if my dad's making dressing or stuffing this year but that's what I look forward to the most every year do you have a favorite food uh, my parents uh, when they come down they always bring pierogi because Ooh, I love pierogies uh, with what my inside? family do you have a favorite one uh, we usually make several kinds because my family makes uh, like 1200. Okay. On on just Did one day. Did you say twelve hundred? Yes, like one thousand two hundred pierogies for the entire family. Like to last like, all year, or just for Christmas. For Christmas. Oh, for Christmas. My goodness. Um. So That's we just have a lot, uh, like potato and chorizo, mm. and that sort of thing. So you eat it with sour cream. I I don't like sour okay. cream. So. Okay. Okay. You're like, Emily, let's get the football. I just want to talk about Christmas and eating because that's what I look forward to. The <sighs> you know most. who's not getting a good Christmas present? The Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, it's not good. We already told fans if you guys want to enjoy your holidays, you might as well just yeah, don't skip watch Sunday. this team. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure Arthur Smith wants to hang around too much either because he just got fined $25,000. Yep. And for... the Falcons got fined $75,000. So a total of $100,000. That's according to for several reports. their little shenanigans. I want to say this was week seven. It was week seven against the Bucks at the Bucks. Where they uh, did not put Bijan Robinson on the injury report, even though after the game, he was like, yeah, I was totally sick that whole time. He had a headache, bad headache. So he says. Just no touches the, just, at all. Just put the guy in the injury. In the first half. On. And then people started wondering, wait a minute. Mm, what, 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 first, what's going on The first on here? little bit of the season, my man was running up and down the field, and now he's not doing much. What, yeah, what's well, happening? I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you can't do that. You're not allowed. Uh, the Really, the, the reason they were fined was because of violation. Right? Yeah. It was a violation of the injury report. Big no-no. It's not like they're the first team or the last team that's going to get in trouble for this. Nope. But my, I think bigger picture, Ellie, is which, what we talk about a lot on this show. And you're already on the hot seat, whether you want to – you know, if you're a fan or you're actually a player or a coach and you want to say he's not, no, no, he's on the hot seat, yeah. okay? And no matter what Arthur Blank has said, he's still on the hot seat as far as Arthur mm -hmm. Smith. So I just wonder if this is easier now for Arthur Blank, if this is easier for the Falcons organization to say, listen, you're already not doing very well. Yeah. And you lied. And you cost us. I mean, it's not. He uh, cost us $100,000. But, you know, you, you kind of made us look bad in the public eye. Uh, you know, here's another uh, reason, another infraction. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, big picture, I wonder, this is not the greatest look when you're already, quote, unquote, in trouble. Yeah, I, I don't think this is really a great look either in terms of just the team in general, especially Arthur Smith. Because in the future, when he does get canned, 
Um, <laughs> Which gonna, you think is going to happen very soon. I think it will happen very soon. He's going to have to look for another job. And this very public incident is going to be in a lot of people's minds That's when they're true. looking to hire him. So they want to, they're going to say, do we want someone who is going to eat a, a $100,000 fine in order to gain such a minimal competitive advantage? It's true. It's true. Wait, I, I should ask though. We should ask Brett real quick. Hey, Brett. When uh, Coach Smith was offensive coordinator for your team, you liked him? Yeah, he was good then. I don't know what happened. Okay, so, you, so you're okay with having him as an offensive coordinator? Like, if, if and when he gets fired from the Falcons, you think another team will hire him as OC somewhere? With a very short leash. With a very short leash. Okay, thank you for that. Brett Gilbert, a man who's on the show quite often, huge Titan fans, <laughs> a yep. fan. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's giving his blessing. And this happens to a lot of coaches, like yeah. DQ, Dan Quinn. I mean, I think Dan Quinn's a great head coach. He kind of just, like, towards the end, didn't have a tight leash on his team, and yeah. players ran with it. Uh, but I think he will be a head coach again, but he's a great defensive coordinator, great defensive coordinator. He's proving that with the Cowboys mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, I think, I think there are a lot of coaches where it's, like, great coordinator, not great head coach, because those are two completely different things. You don't have to manage the egos or manage, you know, a defense or or something like that but also with that being said i don't know why somebody hasn't told him by now or why he hasn't given up his play calling uh abilities uh, you get what i'm saying like i know that that's know. that's the reason he is here is because he's a great yeah offensive mind he's a great play caller on offense but so why don't we at this point as the falcons say okay we're gonna give that up to give it to somebody else and, and try to save your job. But that's the one thing he hasn't done yet. He's changed quarterbacks, but he hasn't done that. And then changed quarterbacks again. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Michael Pittman Jr., though, has been cleared from the concussion protocol for the Colts, the receiver, to play um, on Sunday. So that's just one more weapon. we talked about that hit earlier this week because uh, DeMonte Casey was suspended for the rest of the year for that hit. Yep. But it looks like he, he, he could, might play, uh, which is a good thing. Um, but, you know, I expect the Falcons to at least try to compete on Sunday. I don't necessarily They're expect gonna them try, to win. They're going to try being. But I don't think anybody now. wants to win the NFC South, Ellie. I say that because last no, but night no one the does. Saints are just like, hey, Please take the division. Yeah, no, please. you, you yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, right. Who wants to win? Who wants to take it? Who wants to go? Uh, so right now I like the Bucks, but you never do know. I mean, this certainly is uh, going to be a race till the very uh, final game of the season. Yeah. And somebody, whoever goes, might not even have a winning record. Or might just be at 500 even. Ugh. And then they'll get smacked around in the playoffs. And... I don't like any of it. Hey, okay. Terry, you want to come on? I'm just wondering, you want to come on? Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Terry, Terry might want to come on the show. Our uh, assignment editor there. Yeah. The Dodgers have, the, so far this offseason, we're not even into 2024, have spent a billion dollars on free agents. They signed Shohei Otani not too far, not too long ago for $700 million, although the structure of that contract is completely wild. And last night, they signed another major Japanese free agent, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, a pitcher, for $325 million over 12 years. This guy hasn't pitched in Major League Baseball. He is 24 years old. He balled out in the World Baseball Classic. Had a great season in Japan. Mm. But 12 years. You don't 300 like that, right? and, I'm I just you think you don't it, like it. I'm not. It's not that I don't like it. You think it, it's ridiculous. I think it's. I didn't expect the Dodgers to just drop a billion dollars on free agents. And I'm not even, like, being a hyperbolic billion. when I say a billion dollars. Where do you think all that comes from? Okay, the Dodgers owners have very deep pockets. Let's be real here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, the, the, a billion dollars is not, frankly, not a lot to them. Oh, oh well. Like, it, it just isn't. Imagine if any other team in Major League, anything, had that kind of money. Uh... Steve Cohen does. The Mets do. He's worth like $13 billion. Now, now that's been disappointing. Yes. The, the, 
the one of the rumors was that he was going to go to the Mets or the Yankees. Nope. Nope. He goes to the Dodgers, the super team. Super this this team has to be World Series or bust next year. I mean, you would think that they for the next the ten years. Yeah, you'd think they'd be the favorite, and, and then and then all all the Braves fans will have to watch Freddie Freeman, you know, win several doing more his thing. World Series. He's a good dude, though. I have nothing bad to say about him. I think that he's been he's been he's been nothing but a class act in my yeah. opinion, and he's just so good. I mean, he really is so good. So I, I wish him all well wherever he goes. But just the, the amount of money this team is throwing around is. Blowing my feeble little mind. Yeah, well, good for the players, though, right? <laughs> yeah, good for them. Get get the bag. Yeah, get that money, honey. And then you're looking at, you know, you've still got several more major free agents to go this year. You've got Roki Sasaki next year, who also balled out in uh, World Baseball Classic. Had a fantastic year in Japan this year. Is looking to get posted. He's like 25. No, he's like 22, actually. Uh, and then you have Yamamoto, who's 24. So when this contract ends for the Dodgers, Yamamoto will be as old as Clayton Kershaw is now. Yeah, it's wild. That's in, oh my God, this is. No, it's absolutely wild. It's the, wild. the Dodgers are breaking baseball. All this to lose the NLDS. <laughs> you better stop that. That's funny, though. <laughs> All right. Yesterday, Scott and I discussed the number of... FSU players? FSU players skipping the... I don't even know if they'll have orange enough bowl. to play. And on the flip side, uh, the number of UGA players skipping the Orange Bowl at this point is zero. Um, so, will anybody from the Bulldogs skip this bowl? <laughs> I mean, right now, everyone's saying they're playing. Uh, I don't know if that's going to change anytime closer to kickoff. Uh, however, since Brock Bowers is the one, I hope he doesn't play. But I do believe he will, and I say that because he loves football. Yeah. And even if Kirby puts him out there for, you know, a drive, he'll have played. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the two guys who I think could be questionable, and this is my opinion, this is not anything I've been told, would be Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey because yeah. of their ankle injuries and because they're both going to play in the NFL next season and they both probably should worry about, you know, getting healthy so they can mm -hmm. uh, go on these workouts, private workouts at different teams and be able to compete in the combine. Um, you know, I say that because Nicobe Dean, and again, Nicobe Dean is very different than a Brock Bowers who we know is going to go top 10 no matter what. Uh, but Nicobe Dean was projected to go in the first round a couple years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Um he ended up going to Philadelphia, I think, in the third round. I think he dropped all the way to the third round. But that's because he was injured and he did not yeah. compete in the combine. And that truly can hurt you. Yeah. Uh, he had a pec injury and he wasn't able to do a ton of things. So, uh, you know, somebody like Lad McConkey, who is great. I mean, he was a great player for UGA. He was recruit number like 2 million, right? Nobody yeah. had him on their radar. And he ended up going to Georgia and he had to do so much to prove himself and get on the field. And once he had his opportunity, he ran away with it. But it concerns me with somebody like that who teams will want, more than likely want to see him be on the film, you know, get on the field yeah. uh, at the combine and, and, you know, run some routes and, and uh, you know, catch some balls. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. that's where we are. So uh, I, I don't know. I, nobody's told me whether either of them will or won't play right now. It appears they will. Um, but those are the two that I'm concerned about because of their future. At this point, they need to worry about their future because the dogs are going to kill FSU with or without Brock Bowers yeah. and Ladin McConkey. Because FSU is just going to throw a bunch of freshmen out there and, and hope for the best. No, seriously, will they not be able to play? I mean, they'll have like 40 guys. <sighs> Time to let the freshmen and sophomores ball out. <laughs> just put them on the national stage and say, go get it, kids. I, you know... I, I understand FSU's frustration. Like, if you're a player, a coach, if you're a fan of that team, um, I understand the frustration in which you're going through after, you know, what happened. You should absolutely in be in the CFP. To the CFP. Let's... But let's just say, okay, I, I'm about solutions, not problems. The problem happened, right? They're not right. going to play in, in um, a semifinal game, and they won't have the opportunity to play for a national championship. They probably feel robbed. I feel like almost every single team, there's one team that feels robbed. Do you remember... I don't remember what year it was when Auburn did not play for a national championship. There was three yeah. teams. This was back before the playoffs yeah, this existed. The, this was in the BCS. Yeah, and, and Auburn didn't play. They felt robbed. We're still talking yeah. about it. 
Um, I remember the year Oklahoma State got robbed. That team, I remember it. Huh? I remember the year Oklahoma State got robbed. Yeah, I mean, it happens a lot. It, and sometimes it, it, it looks and feels like blatant, right? And I'm sure yeah. FSU feels that way. But why are we all going to opt out, not play, and just act this way? And, and just not put a good product out on the field because you feel like you were slighted. I, under, I do understand something it. different. I mean, I, I get it, but like, it. Why, why wouldn't we just do something different? Go out there and beat Georgia and say like, hey, listen, we really did have a perfect season. Because you could take it either way. And they're taking it towards the, hey, we're not going to play. We're not going to yeah. do this. We're not going to do that. You know, why does it matter if we play or not? If we win, it yeah. doesn't matter. But I don't know. I would like to see them go out there and try to beat, you know, the team that was number one for mm -hmm. most of the season. And, and finish the year perfect and be able to say, those kids for the rest of their career will be able to say, or the rest of their life will be able to say, hey, yeah. we got slighted, but we still won out and we beat that Georgia team that was supposed to, you know, three-peat. Which I mean, if they, if they somehow pull it off, yeah, uh, it's they, gonna be they, even more impressive because they're gonna be doing it <laughs> right. with a bunch of backups. With, with third stringers, yeah, I might even be asked to go out on the field. I just, you know, I hate that this happened to them. It's not fair, life isn't fair. Somebody was going to get left out, and uh, we don't have to worry about it next season. Or maybe we will. The number 13 team will say, you know what? Just adopt the FCS model. What are we doing here? But 12 teams, I mean, come on. 12 teams to be able to compete, you know, for a national championship. That's a lot. I mean, once, once No, you it can... isn't. <laughs> you don't think? No. If oh, you, the, I think the FCS so. model has 24, and if you've been paying attention to the FCS games, if you've been lucky enough... We've still had amazing football. We've still had great games. Because will ultimately, yes, South Dakota State, the number one seed, gonna run the table. They're gonna win. But that doesn't mean we haven't had good football. I don't get this idea that expanding the playoff is going to result in worse football. It doesn't. Does anybody complain about the first weekend of March Madness? No, that's the best part. Oh, yeah, I agree. But but basketball and football are two very different physical sports. And we can't have them playing a, an extra however many games. I mean, but that the argument used to be we can't do that because we don't pay them. But now that they get paid, who knows? That, that could change. But it's certainly when you are in the, in the hunt for a national championship, you're not sitting out. Your, no. your top players aren't, aren't sitting out. You guys are all competing. And I think, you know, beyond the college football playoff committee continually being told that they're no good and, you know, four teams isn't enough, blah, blah, blah. Um, 12 will allow for better games and more commitment from players mm -hmm. who will play in the National Football League one day because they will be still playing in, in bowl yeah. games. Because, you know, these games, the semifinal games are still treated as a normal bowl game. Yeah. They still go like Alabama and Texas and Washington and whoever I missed out. Who Michigan. Did I miss out? The number one team in the country. <laughs> number one team in the country. <laughs> um, you know, number still, one, quote unquote. Yeah, they're still going to go, you know, like so Michigan and Alabama the day after Christmas, they'll still fly to California, yep. spend the, I'm talking about the entire week there, do the bowl activities, get their bowl gifts, go through practice, and then play. But then come national championship, whoever goes, that's not mm -hmm. a whole week affair. That's come the weekend of and be there for a few days and then play, yep. right? It's a little different. So these kids get their reward, their quote unquote reward until national championship time, which is business time. They treat mm -hmm. that as a business game. We're going there to win the national championship. So, you know, I, I don't know. I'm all for whatever, yeah. whoever wants to do it so nobody feels slighted. But I think a team will, always, somebody will always feel like they deserve yeah. to get into something and, and they don't. Obviously, like, obviously, like, if you go back to the March Madness example, Team 69 is still going to feel slighted <laughs> because they're the first four out. Right. But it's like, okay, if you're not one of the 68 top teams in the country, there's that argument of, were you really going to run the table? I know. I, I do want to let everybody know. Georgia Tech, before we move on to FSU, ACC, because we could talk How about are they that doing? for hours. Georgia Tech is down 7-0 very early in this bowl game that they're playing. The Gasparilla Bowl at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. I went to USF in Tampa, so I know this um, stadium very well. Despite the Bucks playing there, I would go there all the time to watch uh, the Bulls play back in my heyday. So, um, 
UCF uh, basically playing in a home game because yeah. Central Florida is all but one hour away down I-4. I mean, literally, you get on I-4 and you drive for one hour and you're in Tampa from Orlando. Okay, so, going down I-4 for an hour gets you like 10 feet. But. <laughs> no, without traffic and with a, a police escort because you know they got a police escort. So True. You, UCF went right down the highway, took took an hour. Um, they're taking on Tech. Tech, you know, we, I'm sure you've talked about it throughout the week. I don't yeah. think you and I talked about it, but uh, at the beginning of the week. 2018, their last bowl appearance. This is a big deal for them. Yep. Um, but both teams, six and six. I like UCF because I, I like Gus Malzahn. He's a winner. Yeah. And I think he will eventually be able to turn that thing around at UCF. Especially in the Big 12. Uh, not that the Big 12 is becoming weaker, per se, with the departure of Texas and Oklahoma. But UCF, even at 6-6 six and six this season, is in a really good spot to be one of the big teams in the Big 12. I yeah, think. I mean, I, I look forward to seeing what uh, both programs become. Yeah. I mean, honestly. So I know UCF isn't that big of a deal. Um, but some people might say Georgia Tech's not that big of a deal either, yeah. right? So uh, as far as like, cause, because of where we're located, we talk about Georgia Tech. Yeah. But people in Orlando, Tampa, Miami, we talk about UCF. So uh, right now, 7-0, but super early uh, for the Golden Knights. 11 minutes left, first quarter. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what... Uh, Haynes King can do because that man knows how to throw touchdowns. Mm -hmm. He also knows how to throw interceptions. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's been the main dig on him, but he is pretty pretty good with, with his arm. Speaking of another team in the ACC returning to Florida State, oh boy, I'm everyone is getting this sued. Because this, yeah, oh yeah, you're getting sued. Yeah, no, you're getting sued. Yeah. So FSU started it off though. FSU started it off because they now are. 100% serious about wanting to leave the ACC uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so they're suing to get out of the ACC's grant of rights, just sort of their, like, TV contract, I, I think. Uh, that thing is ironclad until about 2033. But $130 million withdrawal fee. Yeah. That thing is ironclad. Now, there are probably Florida State boosters who are willing to pull together $130 million oh, sure. Sure. and just say, we're out, bye bye uh, But the ACC is not, not going to make this easy. <laughs> no, it, what, what's crazy is that they, they're the first school to challenge a grant of rights in court, ever. Um, it's a 38-page lawsuit. And they want the ACC to void the grant of rights and withdraw fee as unreasonable restraints of trade in the state of Florida and not enforceable in their entirety against Florida State. I have no clue what that means. It's a bunch of legalese. Uh, if our anchor Joy Lim Nacron was here, she is a she is an attorney. Uh, she might have been able to parse some of that. Um, and then, uh, just a couple hours, about, about an hour and a half ago, the ACC countersued. Yeah, why not? Let's do it. The quote from, uh, sister station WCTV states, At its core, this case involves the legal promises of Florida State and its obligations to the conference to which it has belonged and from which it has profited for more than 30 years in 2013 and 2016. Florida State, along with the other members of the ACC, agreed to and executed a grant of rights through which it transferred the exclusive media rights to all its home game con contests to the conference. Florida State and other members of the ACC made these grants so the conference can negotiate a long-term contract and agreement with ESPN. By aggregating these collective media rights in the conference, the members were able to realize more value from those media rights than if they had each attempted to market them separately. Now, from my do, understanding, they make about $30 million yes. a year from uh, being part of this. For comparison, I believe the Pac-12 wanted to ask for like 50 before that conference collapse. I and I believe that $50 million number is similar to what SEC schools get, like Georgia. That's interesting. It says, all told, the university estimates the total exit fee, including the forfeiture of television revenue, would be $572 million. 
This is a lot of money, guys. That's a, that's a lot of money. But I feel like college football has gotten to this boiling point, right, with everything that's gone on in the last couple years, few years, you know, mm -hmm. with NIL and with so many teams wanting to go to different conferences, make more money because of TV rights. Yep. Um, it, you know, it's getting to the point with, with situations like this that eventually you've got to wonder, will you see the collapse of conferences altogether one day and just have this like big old like wild, wild west of and, and see, this doesn't affect just college football, right? It would affect college basketball and baseball. And, and the Olympic sport. sports. Yeah, know. I mean, if you're no, no longer competing in certain conferences, and how do you just, I mean, all these contracts, too, you, you know, people do their schedules like 10 mm -hmm. years ahead of time. So yeah, I just I mean, wonder what this is going to lead to, bigger picture, because I feel like FSU is mad right now because of what happened. Yeah, they're mad. Um, but I feel like more schools might go in this direction because as – article states FSU mm -hmm. is the first team to ever do this and once you're the first to do something you've got copycats that follow right after yeah like hey i'm not i'm not happy in this conference no i'm not happy in this conference so um it'll be interesting to see how this shakes out yeah the uh, thing but, the but thing about the acc FSU, is like just else. uh it's just that like that grant of rights that media contract is hard to get out of and the acc made it hard to get out of when they made it yeah uh but back to like what happens now UCLA head coach Chip Kelly, of all people, had what's probably just the best idea, which is separate college football from the other sports, give it a commissioner, and just go back to sensible conferences. Why are we making, like, gymnastics teams from UCLA and Rutgers play each other in conference? Do people understand how big this country is? Yeah. And it's, it's different for different sports, guys. Like football, you get to get on a plane, fly, do all the things. Other sports don't have that money. No, they don't. So it's a diff there's a difference in hitting the road in different kind of ways. <laughs> other so. For other sports, like regional conferences make sense. Yes, like USC versus Ohio State might be fun as an in-conference football game. But as like, you know swimming or wrestling it's like th those things make no sense it's more si it makes more sense for olympic sports to be in these regional conferences so i am 100 percent on board like with the idea of just separating college football entirely it's not even like the ncaa doesn't doesn't crown a an fbs champion to begin with just go full hog and just go whole hog on it separate it entirely this is a interest. I mean, listen. I'm something needs to be done. Something will be done, and I think sooner than later, because, like I said, this will continue to happen now that it's happened once. Yeah. And I mean, next year there'll be so many different teams in different conferences, and even starting with the SEC, the one we care about the most here, Texas um, and Oklahoma. Yeah. And uh, listen, I've always said. Again, my sister went to UF. I went to. You know, we had season tickets when I was in college, and. I would love, and we would always see UF and play uh, play FSU. I would love for FSU to be in the SEC, because then you already have that built-in rivalry like Auburn, Alabama, right? Yeah. You already have that, and I always thought, let's bring in Clemson too, because Clemson and South Carolina already have an in-state rivalry as well. Yep. And these are great teams, and they're in the quote-unquote South, so it makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Like it just makes sense. Uh, and these are, are programs that are historically good. They make a ton of money. If they don't have a problem with uh, recognition, everybody oh. sees, you know, the FSC logo. You know who, you, you know, Clemson, the Paul. Like, you know, right? So yeah. that just makes sense to me. And now we're running out of time, so I need to stop. because we could talk. I told you we could talk about this all day. Yeah, we could talk about this all day. We do not have all day. What's on your mind? Because nothing's on mine, Ellie. Uh, nothing's really on mine, good. especially since we have, like, 30 seconds. Uh, it's been Christmas sports night. tonight. Have a great weekend. For I'm Ellie Parker for Emily Gagnon. See ya. Have a good night, guys. Merry Christmas.